third uh, uh, affirmation session. Uh, it's very important. We're a place where we. This is a place where we produce uh, discourse, but we produce discourse in the interaction of action. I could say, uh, and activism. Uh, and this is very important. The possibility of understanding that what we do here is, has to have uh, an effect uh, out there, being connected, being out there actually, is so important. And this session is crucial because we have uh, Christopher Hawthorne and Vicky Beam that have moved from academia and design and, and law to public uh, service and to, to basically using policy and politics as their run for change and to address questions and this journey is so important, and thank you so much for being here with us. And also talking uh, of, some, of a number of topics that are incredibly timely. And as you were saying, Vicky, before, when have not they been timely, right? Housing uh, density, how to intervene on what exists, and how to do it actionable, so that can be happening fast and with consensus. And, and, and it's great also to have these affirmations uh, with uh, Wei Ping Wu and Anna Lubinsky. Uh, the school is actually uh, very much also affirming that uh, the built environment is interdisciplinary. It's not something that is centered around architecture, but is distributed in a number of knowledges that have to be uh, interacting and collaborating. Uh, the first affirmation session was looking at what it means to project to the future, what it means to actually anticipate the future and the future being a space for uh, uh, wording and worlding uh, the not yet to come and, uh, and I think that this, that was crucial a crucial discussion in a, in, a, in, a, in a number of disciplines that are using images of or projecting images of other versions of what exists as a possibility to re, uh, uh, remobilize society so the social as uh, Albania would teach us to, to say. Um, uh, the second session was incredible as well. It was really looking at what it means to operate ecologically uh, through design and through construction, and what is the way uh, different actors could be mobilized in processes of design, uh, redefining what the, the way they relate to each other as a deep uh, uh, understanding of what ecology means and what also is the case for design to have a say on climate crisis. This is really a unique moment to discuss policy as related to action and design. And I'm so happy to, that we have four people that are very much uh, experts on this and also uh, have a long trajectory doing this. So this, the, the session, as always, is going to be introduced by uh, uh, Barjan Polman. Uh, there's a cohort of 800 people actually following from around the world now and sending questions uh, from people that are in the Ivy League in their offices following this to people that are in refugee camps in Sudan and this is also how we, we want to have this discussion uh, as connected to, to many voices around the world. Thanks. Um, hello all and, and welcome to, to what is now our third affirmation. Um, and as always, I want to welcome all of you who joined us here in person, uh, but also the many of you, as Andres mentioned, who join us remotely, the members of our planetary cohort that take the effort to attend this event live from all over the planet, um, despite sometimes inconvenient time differences. So today's affirmation is titled Design Policy, and we are incredibly happy uh, to have two speakers who have been very involved uh, in policy making join us today, namely uh, Vicky Bean and, and Christopher Hawthorne, um, and to have Wei Ping Wu and Adam Lubinsky um, provide the initial responses to their talks. And something that I cannot state enough is that Affirmations um, really wants to discuss what societies and ecosystems can be. Um, and it's about possible presence and about possible futures. And of course, the notion of policy um, after futurisms and material ecologies in our uh, previous sessions mm -hmm. um, could also be understood as, as, as being central to that. Um, yet, to be sure, this would require a policy not as a sort of one directionally tackling simple or, or less simple tasks or problems of a specific, specific managerial or, or bureaucratic order. Rather, this would entail an understanding of policy as fundamentally intersected with the many complexities um, and ecosystems that we are all part of. And it is precisely in the work of, of, of Christopher mm -hmm. and Vicky that such complexities, I, I believe, are, are, are acknowledged. 
Um, so developing an architectural housing competition in collaboration with um, uh, the LA mayor's office, as in the case of Christopher's low-rise project, is really not about inventing new architectural typologies, um, but rather it operates critically at the intersections of inclusivity, affordability, wildfires, gentrification, racialization, notions of community, aging populations, and so on. Um, so such instances uh, tackle oversights in what Hawthorne calls um, policy donuts, um, policy that leaves holes where in reality complexities, I think, uh, should, should, should be addressed. And similarly, both um, uh, Vicky's research and work in the city has critically <coughs> operated at the intersections uh, of public housing, affordability, segregated neighborhoods, zoning, mortgages, fees, data and envir environmental justice, um, etc. So this is also therefore work that acknowledges um, the ways in which design and design policy in regards to the built environment operates across a multitude of scales. And I love the example um, that Christopher gives about um, how a new green, about certain new green deal incentives and that getting rid of natural gas is actually intrinsically tied to the ways in which um, stovetops, electrical induction stovetops are rendered in the images sort of selling and, and trying to sell and, and market those, those apartments. Um, so the scalar component seems crucial um, and also brings uh, up something specific that might come up later, which is that, you know, despite the fact that both of you work for very specific, almost idiosyncratic cities, Los Angeles and New York, I would also like to know how relevant this concept of the city um, still is for you and, and the work you're, you're doing. Um, so we'll start with a talk uh, by Christopher and, and followed by, by Vicky. Um, and as I mentioned, Last week, this is, this is not a lecture or two lectures uh, followed by a panel. Affirmations uh, really wants to be a planetary conversation. So the presentations will be brief, um, 25 to 30 minutes each. Um, and then we'll have a response <coughs> first by Wei Ping uh, Wu and then by Adam Lubinsky uh, before we open it up to you and the, and the planetary cohort and we'll end around 8.15, 8.20. So and I'll briefly introduce the speakers now. Um, Christopher Hawthorne is a senior critic at Gill School of Architecture with a secondary um, appointment at Gill in English, a regular contributor to the New York Times, the New Yorker and other publications. He was the architecture critic um, for the Los Angeles Times from 2004 to 2018 and from uh, 2018 to 2022 he served as the first chief design officer of the city of Los Angeles, a position appointed by Merrick, Mayor um, Eric Garcetti. And I'm sure you're all very familiar with, with much of his writing, but I want to plug one of his most recent texts, uh, which appeared in the New Yorker issue of September 12, titled How to um, Decolonize the City, in which um, he discusses the exhibition style Congo at Siva in Brussels, and which calls for a new methodology um, of an emerging mode of cultural policy that would apply to the built environment at large. Um, Vicky Bean is the Judge Edward Weinfeld Professor uh, of Law at NYU School of Law, an affiliated professor of public policy of the NYU Wagner Graduate School of uh, Public Service and faculty director of NYU's Furman Center for Real Estate and Urban Policy. Um, Bean returned to NYU in 2022 after serving as Deputy Mayor for Housing and Economic Development of the City of New York from 2019 to 2021. In that role, um, she led a team of more than 30,000 people in financing the new construction and preservation of 200,000 homes on budget and two years earlier than promised. Um, Bean also previously served as uh, the Commissioner of Housing Preservation and Development, HPD, for the City of New York from 2014 to 2017, leading the 2400 person agency to promote affordable housing. Under her leadership, the agency financed the preservation of new construction of no less than 62,500 affordable homes in just three years. Uh, Wei Ping Wu is Professor of Urban Planning mm. and Director um, of the Masters in Urban Planning Program here at Columbia GSEP and the Vice Provost uh, for Academic Programs at Columbia University. Uh, before joining Columbia in 2016, she was a professor and chair in the Department of Urban and Environmental Policy at Tufts University, trained in architecture and urban planning. Professor Wu has focused her research and teaching on understanding urban dynamics in developing um, countries in general and China in particular. Uh, she's an internationally acclaimed urban planning uh, scholar working on global urbanization with a specific expertise in issues of migration, housing and infrastructure of Chinese cities and her publication include nine books, including the essential, um, I would say the Chinese city, as well as many articles in top 
academic journals. And then Adam Lubinsky um, is an associate uh, professor of professional practice um, here at Columbia GSEP and a design, uh, no, sorry, managing principal at uh, WXY Architecture and Urban Design. He has a background in urban design, planning and mobility with more than 15 <coughs> years of experience leading, leading large scale strategic and master plans for public and private sector clients, including extensive work for New York City um, agencies, community development corporations, cultural institutions, and private developers. He has taught here at Cornell, Parsons, and at Bartlett, and holds a PhD in urban planning from University College and a master's from this very school. Um, <coughs> and I also want to thank Yuhi uh, and Erisa for our help uh, in facilitating the questions. And as always, Clarisse, um, who is managing the online questions from the planetary mm -hmm. cohort. And with that, I think we're ready um, to get started. So, Christopher. Thank you so much, Bart. Thank you, Andres, for the invitation. Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening to everyone on the live stream as well. It's, it's fantastic to be back at Columbia and in conversation with all of you. Very much looking forward to it. I will get right into it. Um, as Bart mentioned, I was the architecture critic at the Los Angeles Times for almost uh, 15 years. And I wrote about all kinds of things, including uh, the border wall prototypes. But in the latter years of that position, I really concentrated on the urbanism and civic identity of Los Angeles. And in that capacity, got to know when he was a uh, council member, Eric Garcetti, then council president, and then when he became mayor of Los Angeles, we did some public conversations about the future of the city with a focus on the built environment in Los Angeles and the architecture uh, and design character of the city. And in that capacity, um, uh, got to know the mayor and his, uh, his ambitions for the city along those lines quite well. Um, in the spring of 2018, he asked me to take on a newly created position called Chief Design Officer for the city. I didn't think I would ever leave the LA Times. There are not very many full-time architecture critic positions, uh, especially these days. It's a shrinking number. Um, and I felt very supported in the work that I was doing. I had lots of autonomy um, at the Los Angeles Times. Nonetheless, it seemed like too exciting uh, and challenging an opportunity to pass up. So the role um, as we defined it together, the mayor and I really um, involved design oversight on the one hand of existing projects and new initiatives uh, to promote effective, equitable and sustainable design. Um, and my focus was really across the board, a range of projects involving the public right of way, public art at LAX and elsewhere. A lot of work on procurement and digging in, as I'm sure Vicky can appreciate, to the language that relates to design in RFP, RFQ, and other procurement documents. Um, thinking, given the intensity of the climate crisis, thinking about shade from an equity point of view and as a kind of infrastructure in Los Angeles. Um, and then two topics that I'll concentrate on in my remarks this evening, civic memory and housing policy. My position was based in the mayor's office. Um, there are pluses and minuses to uh, advantages and disadvantages to being uh, in a, an appointee of an elected official as opposed to being um, in a city department. And we can talk a little bit about that maybe later. Um, but I really did collaborate with a number of city council offices, city departments. Um, Speaking of that last point, um, unlike New York, which I think has more than 50, right? City Council of 51, right? 59 uh, city council offices. Los Angeles has just 15 in a city of 4 million people. Uh, LA County has just five supervisors for a county of 10 million population. That means that a lot of land use authority in particular by tradition and by policy and by law flows through individual council offices and uh, council members, planning deputies, which complicated some of the work I'm about to share with you in some, uh, in some interesting ways. Um, so the design oversight work included major public projects like this new um, essentially gateway airport connector at LAX, as well as public projects at prominent locations. This is a pl um, planned two tower development at the site of my former employer, the Los Angeles Times, which decamped uh, its headquarters to El Segundo on the west side of Los Angeles. I worked, as I mentioned, quite a bit on issues related to shade and shade equity, um, particularly in the public right of way, and that included uh, working on a new street furniture contract um, with designs for new transit shelters by Skidmore, Owings and Merrill. 
uh, as well as a lot of projects related to COVID and post-COVID, including uh, design standards for uh, our outdoor dining program, which we called El Fresco. Um, and with a number of partners at USC and, uh, and elsewhere in Los Angeles, um, spent some time thinking about the future of the 550 to 600 gas station sites just in the city of Los Angeles, um, which will have to uh, find new uses after 2035 when gas-powered vehicles are phased out in the state of California. Practically speaking, it will probably happen even sooner than that. So we invited a number of architects um, and design firms to help us think about uh, whether those uh, gas stations, which um, are under private ownership, it's important to say, and also will, will need significant remediation, might be turned into housing to open space or other kinds of community centers. This is uh, one of the responses to that prompt uh, from Jeffrey Inaba and his firm Inaba Williams. But as I mentioned, I want to concentrate this evening on two um, areas of initiatives in particular that I worked on while I was chief design officer. Those are housing and civic memory. On the housing front, I think most of you will be familiar uh, uh, with this photograph, maybe among the most famous architectural photographs of the 20th century. Um, and it suggests the extent to which there is a very stubborn idea that residential architecture and maybe architecture more broadly begins and ends in Los Angeles with the single family house and the case study program which produced the Stahl House certainly was part of that story, as is artwork by artists like David Hockney and others who really equated the good life or an idea of the California version of the American dream with the single family house, the swimming pool, the private garden, et cetera. Certainly it's fair to say that the individual house continues to be a, a locus of experimentation and innovation. This was particularly true when it came to architects of color in 20th century Los Angeles, like Paul Williams, who was prohibited not just from building or buying property in certain neighborhoods, but even from spending the night in certain areas of Southern California when he was a practicing architect, which makes, makes uh, his own house in Lafayette Square neighborhood of Los Angeles all the more significant. Um, in connection to that history of innovation. Uh, and certainly that continued all the way through the latter uh, years of the 20th century and the work that Frank Gehry and a number of other architects were doing in rethinking and reinventing the single family house typology. And because of that, the single family house became across Southern California really a kind of infrastructure um, by mid-century when uh, new subdivisions like this one in Lakewood were being developed um, at a, a regional, really a macro scale across the region. That leaves us with the zoning map that we have today, which as you can see here um, reflects the fact that more than three quarters of the residential land in the city of Los Angeles is zoned single family uh, even today, uh, which suggests some of the challenges that we face in our, in our housing policy writ large. That ignores though that story, that narrative, that set of tropes ignores a really rich history, vital history of innovation uh, in multifamily housing in the decades leading up to World War II, leading up to mid-century in what we now think of as the missing middle scale, uh, beginning really in the late 19th century with bungalow courts and continuing through early experiments by Irving Gill, uh, Schindler, Neutra, other modernists, and continuing through mid-century at a bigger scale uh, in projects like Village Green. Uh, which really did achieve a, a kind of humane solution to uh, the housing crunch and the population growth uh, in the 30s and leading into World War II, which led us after World War II to the typology that may be familiar to some of you um, uh, born in Los Angeles called the Dingbat, uh, which was essentially two or three story uh, apartment buildings over uh, typically um, uh, covered parking, sometimes garage parking at street level, which helped f quite affordably, in fact, house uh, successive waves of newcomers to Los Angeles uh, who came in really uh, uh, significant numbers after federal uh, immigration reform happened in 1965 when we saw a significant leap in the immigration to Southern California from uh, Latin America and, a and Asia in particular. Um, leading to, some of you may remember the film Slums of Beverly Hills, which uh, features a dingbat quite prominently. Uh, many of them, if we go back, had names like Beverly Capri, 
uh, or Casabella, these sort of aspirational names, and the word dingbat actually comes from uh, this little uh, uh, typographical feature, which was often affixed as a bit of ornament or decoration to the facade of these buildings. Um, but they were so popular, and so many of these buildings and apartment buildings like them uh, began to sprout all over Los Angeles and significantly for our discussion this evening, move into single family and low rise neighborhoods that they, pr they uh, produced a pretty severe and actually politically speaking quite successful backlash in a series of no growth and slow growth uh, efforts in the 1970s and accelerating in the 1980s, which through uh, ballot measures, other kinds of zoning changes really um, reduced, as you can see in this uh, now within LA housing circles, famous diagram that comes from uh, a dissertation by Greg Mora when he was at UCLA, which suggests that the zoning capacity of Los Angeles was reduced from about 10 million to below 4 million uh, by the end of that slow growth effort in 1990, which leaves us with some of the issues that we have today um, and some of the issues that we were working to address during my time in the mayor's office. Much of state housing policy is set in California at the state level um, in Sacramento, and then there is a negotiation between uh, state housing laws and how those laws are implemented or carried out in individual cities. So some of the projects I'm about to talk about um, are really about that negotiation between new streamlining or zoning changes at the state level in Sacramento and then how that played out at the city level uh, in Los Angeles. But the efforts to upzone, particularly single family neighborhoods statewide, kept hitting a number of roadblocks, particularly because of opposition, importantly, from Southern California lawmakers in Los Angeles and Los Angeles County. Um, so that produced a kind of stalemate, and there this stalemate was in place when I joined the mayor's office in 2018. On the one hand, it was very clear, if you think back to that zoning map that I showed, that that is not a sustainable land use model for the 21st century in terms of our climate goals, uh, in terms of our housing affordability goals. It's clear that there has to be an effort to locate new housing more strategically, intelligently, near transit and jobs. Um, on the other hand, most elected officials, including the mayor who appointed me, uh, it's fair to say, saw uh, no incentive in wading into that territory and promoting a zoning reform. In fact, they saw only downside, politically speaking. So we had this sort of Gordian knot. On the one hand, uh, a clear sense that this zoning map was not sustainable. On the other, very uh, um, uh, clear difficulty in terms of imagining politically speaking a way forward and giving incentives to elected officials to wade into that territory, which is where this low rise effort that we're going to talk about comes into play. And there are some particular complications that are unique to the state of California. Uh, this is a permanent supportive housing proposal uh, funded in part by an um, uh, affordable housing bond. Uh, by Erico and Moss Architects that was designed to fill two city-owned surface parking lots. Hard to think of a better site for new affordable housing. No, no building has to get knocked down. Nobody has to get displaced. Uh, but, but because this project is within the half-mile wide band uh, that falls under the jurisdiction of the California Coastal Commission, the California Coastal Commission sees parking access to the beaches and the coasts of California and maintaining that parking access as part of its mission, not really seeing a contradiction between that and the larger environmental mission um, uh, that it was charged with. And as a result, uh, we had to uh, replace every one of the parking spaces um, that were in those surface parking lots in addition to the new parking that would be added to serve the new residents of the project. So uh, a project of about 150 units um, then suddenly required about 450 uh, parking spaces. Uh, proving uh, an adage from the, the uh, parking reform guru at UCLA, Don Shoup, that form follows not function in California often, but parking requirements. So we endeavored, foolheartedly or not, uh, foolishly or not, to, to uh, wade into this territory and really wanted to think about how we could create a platform for elected officials and, and the city as a whole to have a more productive conversation um, about housing policy. Um, because as Bart mentioned, we really had a hole in our housing policy donut on the uh, one end at the level of accessory dwelling units and second units, we saw really terrific production 
uh, and we were seeing really tr uh, terrific um, results of policy changes um, and public subsidy for larger scale projects, both market rate um, and affordable subsidized projects. But uh, the so-called missing middle, particularly four to 10 units, but really anywhere from two to about 20 units uh, was the hole in that donut. But we wanted to organize this quite differently from other competitions. Uh, I think everyone will be familiar with a feeling in many communities, particularly communities of color, that design competitions can also often take uh, ideas from architects outside of communities and see those ideas imposed on communities. Uh, we wanted to reverse that dynamic and so we very intentionally started the process with a number of listening sessions which informed the brief. This is one on community land trusts. Um, we made those sessions required viewing for anyone who wanted to participate in what we ended up calling a design challenge instead of a competition for some reasons that we reflected what we heard in those listening sessions. And I don't expect that you'll read every name on this list, but we had four different juries. Um, and this, because we had tenants, affordable housing developers, um, community land trust leaders, uh, it was a very different kind of jury than is typically the case in a competition. And as a result, and as, as a result of making those listening sessions required viewing for anyone who, who participated, we really did have a much different conversation that was much more attuned to the sensitivities around displacement and future of community color, uh, communities of color than is typically the case uh, in this kind of competition. And that was certainly a, um, a departure, I think, from the ways in which earlier efforts to address the housing crisis in Los Angeles through architecture uh, like the case study program uh, operated. I don't think John Intenza was thinking about redlining or, uh, or, or uh, mortgage subsidy when he was uh, engaging those architects, right? So we had four categories in this design challenge. Uh, one of the winners was a young architect um, uh, from New York. Um, looking at four to 10 unit sites of various kinds, um, this is a winner in the fourplex category, which imagines um, taking a single family lot and accommodating four units um, with architecture by Om Givning and landscape by um, Studio MLA, my Mia Lair's firm. Uh, and we were tremendously encouraged by the response that we had to low rise nearly 400 uh, submissions and a really robust uh, series of conversations that continues in Los Angeles about the future of single family and low rise neighborhoods. Another project we worked on was uh, had to do with streamlining and promoting the ongoing success of our ADU program, which was a design pre-approval program for ADUs. We invited a number of particularly young and emerging offices to take part in a pilot project. And then once the project launched, it was available open to any architect who could uh, meet the basic qualifications. Basically, this allows architects uh, to submit designs for pre-approval, go through uh, the process of getting those approved through our Department of Building and Safety. Homeowners can then uh, work with the participating architects um, uh, to negotiate a fee with the exception of this new addition to the program, which is owned outright by the city of Los Angeles and can be downloaded for free um, by homeowners who are seeking to add an ADU. Uh, ADUs now make up consistently between 20 and 25% of our housing units produced in Los Angeles, which is on the one hand, a sign of the success of these programs, on the other, a sign of the stubborn uh, size of the hole in that donut um, that so many are happening uh, at the second unit. Um, and we did anticipate, of course, some final uh, breakthroughs at s in Sacramento. And sure enough, um, uh, after this competition, sorry, after this effort uh, had been launched, uh, state lawmakers in, in Sacramento uh, finally uh, broke through that log jam to make the uh, fourplexes um, legal to build on single family parcels statewide, which is again something we had specifically anticipated in one of the, uh, one of the categories. Um, we had some very nice coverage, including a, a piece by Michael Kilman in the Times. Um, and a couple of takeaways. Um, one is why focus on this, uh, this uh, scale? One is that um, the, the kind of hole in the donut that I mentioned, but also if you, if you look at the second bullet, um, there are a number of studies that suggest that uh, these 10 to two unit projects uh, tend to be on a per unit basis by far the most, uh, the least expensive and most affordable to build. It's because they're typically one to two stories, uh, wood frame construction. It's exactly the kind of construction that, um, that we know how to, to build in, uh, in Southern California. 
um, but also in terms of filling, um, filling what had been um, a kind of vacuum of policy. Because of that log jam, no elected officials, no public policy discussions were moving into that territory. That left a vacuum that was consistently filled over the last two decades with pretty apocalyptic and alarmist visions from housing opponents um, about, the, um, uh, about the, the damage that would be wrought in communities uh, if we allowed first ADUs and then, let's say, a fourplex. We wanted to tap into the intelligence of architects and landscape architects to help, um, to help balance that a little bit. In the, in the few minutes that I have left, I want to talk about um, another initiative uh, that was central to the work that I did when I was in the mayor's office, um, and that is what we ended up calling the mayor's office civic memory working group, which was our version of the discussion that was happening all over the country beginning in 2017, 2018, 2019 about uh, fraught histories, controversial monuments and memorials, beginning, of course, with Confederate monuments and many uh, southern cities and states. Uh, some of you may have seen the Ed Ruscha show at MoMA, which I recommend to you if you haven't seen it. And you may have seen a variation on this, uh, this piece, which suggests, I think, the complexity of LA's relationship with history. Los Angeles has long been very proud of the fact that, that uh, it's a city understood as a city of the future, maybe the city of the future the headquarters of the Hollywood Dream Factory, a place that has, has, has had its civic gaze really firmly fixed on the future. Um, and as a result, has neglected many elements of its past, um, has relied on myth-making and boosterism uh, more than most cities, uh, and has been guilty of more aggressively whitewashing difficult moments of its past, I think, than is the case in many American cities. So. Uh, in an effort to tap into that national conversation on the one hand, but also tailor it specifically to this peculiar relationship that LA enjoys with history, uh, we convened a group of what ended up being more than three dozen um, historians, architects, indigenous leaders, uh, colleagues of mine in city government uh, in what we call, as I mentioned, the Mayor's Office Civic Memory Group which really set out to explore this question about wha what new policies might help the city commemorate its history more fully, more accurately, more honestly, especially, as I said, where that history is fraught or has been whitewashed. Um, and we were guided throughout by this quote from the great Isabel Wilkerson, which is a, often a, a useful response to anyone who would say, well, why am I responsible for the sins uh, of my ancestors or forebears? Um, and uh, particularly, not least for its architectural metaphor, um, we uh, relied uh, on this as a kind of touch point for us as we were doing this work and facing those questions. Also, we launched this uh, group in, in, uh, toward the end of 2019, and then we paid very close attention um, uh, as the city really changed around us in the next two years, and we saw some really remarkable examples of bottom-up community-led commemoration um, first with the, uh, following the, the shooting death of the rap rapper Nipsey Hussle, uh, which produced an amazing, as you can see, outpouring uh, of grief and commemoration in his honor. Similarly, when Kobe Bryant uh, was killed in a helicopter crash in early 2020, not long after we started our work, an incredible outpouring of completely organic, um, community-led uh, memorialization and commemoration. Uh, and then, of course, after the murder of George Floyd and during COVID, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, marches, and conversation um, uh, that that provoked in Los Angeles, as in so many other cities. We also, again, to get back to the peculiar relationship of Los Angeles and memory, wanted to pay attention to the ways in which, despite our lack of monuments, public squares, uh, statues, uh, the way in which we had our own language of commemoration and have our own language in Los Angeles, uh, and the ways in which we understand uh, memory through movement, um, uh, as can be seen uh, in this juxtaposition of Randy's Donuts, um, one of the classic examples of uh, car-friendly architecture where the sign is uh, quite a bit larger than the building it's advertising. Uh, but this is when the Space Shuttle Endeavor was returned um, after being retired from service to its spot in the, to in the California 
Science Center and Exposition Park near USC, and it moved through the city of Los Angeles in a kind of slow motion, slow speed parade um, that drew hundreds of thousands of spectators and allowed us to commemorate in a certain way, in a very LA way, uh, a history of aerospace innovation um, in the city of Los Angeles, which is very important to the history of the city. The results of all of that work in conversation was a report in print form and on a website called Past Due. Um, even the design of the project, we wanted to communicate the ambition of it. We worked with a fantastic uh, graphic design studio in Los Angeles called Polymo. They developed new typefaces for the project, um, bespoke typefaces that reflected certain cultural histories in Los Angeles. We had 18 key specific policy recommendations, but we really wanted to flesh that out. We didn't want this to be a typical city document, and the design, of course, was was meant to reflect that. Um, we also commissioned new writing, new photography, um, and wrapped that together in this publication that was uh, endorsed by Mayor Garcetti in April of 2021, about 18 months or so after we had started our work. So it included commemorations of a certain particular um, important uh, sites of historical memory, including the site at UCLA where the first uh, internet message was sent to Palo Alto, um, but also much thornier, trickier issues like um, the legacies of Spanish colonialism and Unipero Serra and what to do with uh, statues of Serra uh, all throughout Southern California, which are our version to a certain extent of Confederate statues. Very difficult subject given that Serra has been canonized by the Catholic Church on the one hand and on the other that statues and seeing his name and history represented are a source of great pain. We heard from, uh, from Native communities repeatedly in our work. Um, it's still all of this work contained uh, on the website at civicmemory.la. A couple of key themes that emerged from this work, we heard in our conversations with communities that too often the city was acting as a kind of gatekeeper when it came to civic memory and that communities were much more interested in the city figuring out how to facilitate new expressions of organic community uh, bottom-up uh, uh, memory. Uh, we really tried to uh, 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 avoid the document being prescriptive or being a set of rules. Uh, we really paid careful attention to community outreach and engagement, uh, and we allowed the report to disagree with itself. We didn't want to aim for some illusory, illusory consensus. These are incredibly difficult um, uh, subjects with a range of valuable perspectives, and we wanted to engage those, and that's also what made this, I think, different from a typical uh, city or mayor's office document that it allowed that level of uncertainty uh, and debate even within its pages. That work has continued to spin off a number of initiatives that I have uh, remained involved in. Uh, the report helped us um, shape commemorations for the very difficult 30th anniversary of 1992, uh, the civic uprising that followed the acquittal of the police officers uh, charged with beating Rodney King. This was a an event, a uh, poster for an event that was designed by Polymode, the same design studio that, that did the original report. And importantly, we continue to hear echoes uh, and see connections between some of the events that we explored that had been forgotten or whitewashed or buried and, and ongoing debates uh, about civic identity. This is an image from the Mexican repatriation uh, which happened during the depths of the Depression. This is the report uh, page that deals with it. Um, somewhere between uh, 400,000 and 2 million uh, Mexicans and Mexican Americans were repatriated um, against their will. Many of them uh, citizens of the United States, um, and Los Angeles was the epicenter of, uh, of that uh, effort. Uh, and now, as we hear, I think particularly crowding into the mainstream from the right, new debates about birthright citizenship important to remember um, that we have in our own blue cities histories uh, uh, um, very similar to that that we understand I think too little. The final thing that I'll talk about this evening is the, the most significant project yet to emerge directly from the civic memory recommendations which is uh, an effort to build um, uh, and realize a memorial to the victims of the 1871 Chinese massacre which remains the deadliest episode of racial violence in Los Angeles history. 10% of the Chinese population was killed in a single evening. 
even more shocking to me is the fact that 10% of the Los Angeles population at the time participated in the mob violence that, uh, that killed um, that killed those uh, Chinese residents, all men of Los Angeles, uh, in 1871. Uh, we worked with um, an AAPI-led design firm in Los Angeles called Folder Studio um, to do a request for ideas, an RFI document to um, solicit submissions for a new memorial. Uh, again, I don't expect you to read all these names, but this suggests um, the extent of the engagement in this process. We brought together a steering committee of Chinese American leaders in Chinatown and in the larger Chinese American diaspora in Southern California, which is quite extensive. This group ultimately numbered more than 75 uh, leaders who helped inform the brief and the plans for this project. Um, and after uh, a really remarkable collection of submissions, uh, the city selected this proposal uh, from Nicholas Leong and Judy Chung um, along North Los Angeles, which is where uh, most of the violence that day in 1871 took place. Really a remarkable uh, response to that RFI. Um, but it's not just at the primary site, which is here next to the Chinese American Museum. It also reflects the distributed nature of the violence. That violence um, really took place across the entire geography of Los Angeles as it existed in 1871. Um, but also some sites of sanctuary uh, as Chinese were fleeing downtown, um, fleeing the site of the violence. There were certain uh, uh, white property owners in Los Angeles who opened their properties as sites of sanctuary. So uh, a silver lining on a very, very dark uh, day. Uh, we wanted uh, this to be a new kind of kind of distributed or networked memorial that would have a primary gathering spot uh, at the location of violence, but also reflect the geography uh, of um, of the massacre itself and I embedded in the sidewalk will be um, these markers sort of leading visitors uh, uh, through uh, this narrative uh, in build space. And very pleased to say that um, thanks to some recent support from the Mellon Foundation and its Monuments Project, in addition to significant city funding that's already in place, the project is at its primary site fully funded um, and moving full speed ahead. So I look forward to talking about some of the lessons I learned from this experience, particularly as they relate to procur procurement, uh, community engagement, these issues, these kind of Gordian knots of public policy. Um, but I will leave it there for now, and thank you very much. Well, first of all, um, Thank you for uh, for sponsoring this, Bart and Andres, and, and thank you for having me here, and thank you for that incredible uh, presentation. I, I have some sense of what's involved in these public design and, and memory uh, issues, and they're very, very thorny, so congratulations for, uh, for all you accomplished there. So I want to um, take us back to, uh, to New York and, uh, and do want to say thank you to all the folks who are online. Uh, from all over the world. Um, at so I, I risk being too parochial here by talking about New York, but I think that the issues that we're facing in terms of how do we redevelop our single family neighborhoods, our, our low density neighborhoods, are, are issues that people are facing all over the world. So I, I hope that there are things that, um, that we can take from that. So um, let, me, let me just start by putting this in context. Those of you who are uh, New Yorkers or who recently moved here to go to school will know that New York has an affordability crisis, has for uh, as long as I've been here, um, which is almost 40 years. So, um, but, but just to uh, you know, put a little bit of context into that, let me just talk for a moment about that crisis. Um, the crisis, first and foremost, is, is a problem that the increase in our rents and our housing prices, but I'm going to focus on rents because uh, they tend the largest portion of the city of New York is renters, the largest portion of our population is renters, and, um, and because renters tend to be uh, lower income than, uh, than homeowners. So you see here both New York State and New York City. The, um, so the red lines um, here are the rate of the growth in rents if they were indexed to the uh, prices in 1980. 
um, and how much they've increased. And you see for the really the first two decades uh, up until 2000, they, they were pretty close. Rent was rising at about the same rate that incomes were rising. And so, you know, if you could afford um, the place that you were living in, you probably could continue to afford that place because your income was rising parallel to what, rent, what, what was happening to rents. But what happened starting in 2000 is that incomes took a nosedive, rents took a quite steep increase in both the state and the city, and that just left a huge gap in what people could afford to pay for the homes that they had been living in. Um, as, as rents grew. Rents grew more th faster than inflation for all segments of uh, New York, from the lowest income, uh, or the lowest rent, I should say, uh, 25th percentile, where rents um, increased here in New York City by 14% just in the last 11 years, from 2010 to 2021. And at the median rent, uh, increased by 19%. This is after inflation. So that's a very steep increase for just 11 years um, uh, in, in all these different segments. Between a quarter and a third of all New York State residents, including New York City residents, renters, um, pay more than half of their income for their rent, for housing expenses, not just a third of their income, which is what we consider if you're paying more than a third, you're rent burdened. If you're paying more than a half, you're severely rent burdened. <clears throat> that leaves you very little money to pay for medicine, for to educate your kids, um, to buy food. Um, and yet we have these very high shares of our renter populations who are paying more than half of what they take home, what their income is. And for our very poorest New Yorkers, the 28% of our renters, or almost a million people, who are what we just define as extremely low income, making less than $27,810 for a family of four, for those people, the situation is really almost impossible, right? We would need about 656,000 more homes priced at, at um, uh, you know, a, a, an, a rent that they could afford in order to make that share of our renter population not be so rent burdened, right? In fact, while they make 27810 um, that's the number, they would need about 83000 in order to afford the um, median two-bedroom rental in New York City. So that's, you know, when you think about just the enormity, first of all, of the number of people, right, uh, the number of households, not just the number of people, but the number of households, what we would need to come up with in order to make housing affordable for those households, and just how huge the gap is between what they make and what it would be necessary for them to pay for a two-bedroom house it's really um, a remarkable uh, you know, crisis. And the crisis in, is in large part, not exclusively, but in large part caused by the fact that we just aren't producing enough housing. So if you uh, look here, the city of New York um, has a per capita uh, permitting rate of about 24 um, homes per thousand people, whereas Los Angeles is doing uh, better. Um, and if you look up the scale, you see your, your southern uh, cities, your southeastern cities, your you know, Texas, um, but even the District of Columbia. I mean, look at that. It's almost four times the, amount, the, the number of new homes permitted per capita as New York is providing. So it's a dramatic difference. So if you're not producing that level of housing, you're going obviously to have a housing shortage and where you have a housing shortage, you're going to have higher rents, right? Um, also, if you put it in context over time, we're building far less than we used to build. The 1920s is, a, is a, certainly an outlier where we built more than 700,000 homes in a decade, right? Um, but 
there were many, many times, the 1950s, the 1960s, where we were building north of 300,000. Even the 1970s, the decade of the fiscal crisis, we, were, we, we permitted 171,000 homes. Today, we really struggle. Um, we did 169,000 in the 2010s. And we're still making up for, or trying to make up for, this incredible deficit that we saw in the 1980s and 1990s. We're in the entire decade of the 1990s, we only permitted 80,000, 81,000 homes, right? So it's, an, it's a remarkable drop off and shows just what the supply problem um, uh, is. As a result, our vacancy rate is dangerously low. Economists consider a healthy vacancy rate to be around 7%. You need houses to be turning over, rents, uh, apartments to be turning over in order to give people choices, in order for there to be um, spaces available on the market when a household needs um, to move. And that's considered at around 7% hours hovers um, between, oops, um, uh, sorry, um, between three and 4%. 5% is considered under New York law an emergency. We are still in an emergency that we have had um, uh, you know, for decades. Um, so the result is that over these last um, few decades, housing has become just incredibly more expensive. So this is a, a map that shows you in 2010, the share of tracts within a county where the person making median income, the median income for that tract, could afford the median priced home or apartment, right? And you see that green, dark, the dark green is over 75% of the homes were affordable to somebody making the median income. Um, and, uh, and the red is less than 10%, the pink is 10 to 25%. And you see what's happened in New York, which is, uh, for those of you who, who are map challenged, right, this is the New York area in here uh, of the Northeast. And what you see is we went from all that green um, to all that pink and red. So in that red, for example, if I'm making the median income for my tract, I can only afford 10% of the homes in that tract, right? And this is a tremendous problem for the sort of superstar cities, Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, and the coasts, but it's also a problem almost, well, let me put it this way, a lot of places throughout the United States. So I, I've showed you the same map for the southeastern U.S., you know, where we think of as a high growth, Atlanta, you know, Charlottesville, uh, those kinds of um, f places. And you see again, this move from that dark green to all pink and red, right? The only areas of the United States that are not that now that pink and red are the sort of breadbasket states, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, on up to the Dakotas and, and the Northern states. Those are the only ones now in the United States that don't have that um, affordability crisis. So it's something that we're facing all over. What to do about it, right? Where are we going to build in order to get the kind of supply that we need? We've tried to fix it with high rises. And for those of you um, who are familiar with in New York, this is a picture taken in 2013 and then again in 2013, 2023 looking into Manhattan from Brooklyn. And what you, what you see here is all of the downtown Brooklyn high rises and the uh, East River uh, waterfront, Greenpoint, Williamsburg uh, waterfront high rises that have gone out, up, which now actually block the view of the high rises in Manhattan. Um, so we've tried um, to fix this with high rises and we'll continue to do that, right? Um, but, we're running out of land that's appropriate for those high rises. We're running out of air that's appropriate for those high rises because in New York City, the state prevents us from going higher on residential than uh, what we call 12 floor area ratio, right? If you're building an office building, you can build 
2430 FAR. If you're building residential under state law in New York City, we can only build to 12 FAR. So we can't really go any higher um, with those high rises than, than what we already have, or bigger with those high rises. As, uh, as, as was pointed out, it's very expensive to build high rises versus an eight to 10 unit building, right? When you talk about having to use steel, when you talk about the foundations that you need, the elevators, the cores that you need, high rises are very, very expensive. The residents of all the high rise neighborhoods think that they've done quite a bit already and don't think that they should bear an unfair share of accommodating the city's growth. And then last but not least, the environmental consequences of all the low density, highly car dependent, um, uh, and very flood prone areas in the city. Um, those environmental consequences, as we saw uh, really tragically last week, um, and several years ago are, are really beginning to catch up with us or possibly even outrun us. So there's been a lot of talk about gentle density, the kind of middle ha housing that Christian referred to. Um, and those approaches are expanding across the countries. We're seeing a lot of places, not just on the coast, not just Oregon, Washington, et cetera. But, um, but really all over the United States start to talk about gentle density. So, and um, it's uh, become an issue even in New York. Last week, Mayor Adams announced his uh, City of Yes for Housing Opportunity, where he proposed that every neighborhood had to allow more development in order to accommodate um, our housing needs. And last year, Governor Hochul proposed that every neighborhood in the city um, have, to, have to allow growth at a rate of about 3% every three years. And every suburban jurisdiction that isn't served by mass transit had to, suburban and rural, had to allow at least 1% over, over a three-year period. Neither of these has been passed. Um, and uh, Governor Hochul's housing plan last year um, went down pretty hard. Um, and Mayor Adams' proposal um, has to go through 59, the 59 community boards. So it's not going to be an easy lift. So what are these low-density neighborhoods that we're talking about? So um, the Furman Center, um, where I am one of the faculty directors, looked at the bottom quartile of the city's community districts by density. And what you see here in blue are all those areas. Not surprisingly, Staten Island, the furthest away from the central, from the old fashioned concept of a central business district on Eastern Queens, Northern Bronx, um, and the Rockaways are our lowest density neighborhoods. What you see are some of the housing types that we see in those areas. Um, these happen to be in Queens. And if you look at, well, what are they contributing to the growth of New York and to the housing needs of New York? The lowest density neighborhoods saw the lowest percentage increases in their housing stock over the last decade. So over the last decade, the lowest density uh, uh, community districts grew just barely over 2% or permitted um, uh, about 2% of their housing stock over that um, decade. Whereas the highest density uh, areas uh, permitted a, a little bit more than 3% and the city overall uh, permitted a little more than 5%. Now, one of the things that that tells you is the highest density, the high rises that I talked about earlier being sort of uh, where we tried first, are actually not even pulling what might be considered to be their fair share. It's really the two quartiles in the middle, the middle density neighborhoods that are bearing most of the weight of the new housing construction uh, in New York over the last decade. Only two of the lowest density community districts met the governor's standard of 3% growth over a three-year period in the 
to 2022 um, period, the Rockaways and, and uh, some at one area in uh, Queens, Jamaica, Queens. And many people think, well, that's not quite fair because there are there is about 45% of the land, not 75% as, as in LA, but about 45% of the land and yet it's only home to about 28% of the city's population. That's also the case in the low density suburbs um, of Westchester and Long Island, right? Which are, are providing far less housing than, the s than New York City and than the New Jersey suburbs, um, which are building a great deal to accommodate the jobs that are coming into the tri-state area but the Westchester and Long Island uh, suburbs are not uh, stepping up in the same way um, and have very low uh, permitting rates. So that's a problem on fairness grounds on a, for a couple of dimensions, right? One is that some of these low density neighborhoods are among the city's highest opportunity neighborhoods. They have some of the city's best schools. So you see here those low density uh, neighborhoods which are again the sort of not not the darkest green but the second uh, darkest green and that on the on the uh, your left side is student fourth grade student performance in language arts and on the right side fourth grade student performance on math and you s you do see that some of the lowest density areas are the very best uh, performance in the city uh, in terms of our of how kids are doing in our schools. Similarly, some of the lowest density neighborhoods have some of the lowest crime in the cities, in the city. And I want to be clear that that's for the community districts as a whole. Within a community district, if you drill down further than into the track level, not at the CD level, at the community district level, you see that there are very different patterns within a community district and that there are areas of density in every one of the low density community districts that tend to be poorer, more uh, composed of people of color, and that where you have vast differences in measures like, um, like school quality. What about um, in terms of who lives in the community districts that are the lowest density? Contrary to, I think, the common perception, they are not all white, right? In fact, they are less white than the city as a whole, right? Um, they are more Asian and more non-Hispanic black than the city as a whole. So they are not, I mean, our, our concept is often, you know, parts of Queens that we think of as being uh, very, very uh, upper income and white, um, but that is not what marks um, all the, 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 the totality of our low, dis low density uh, districts. And so we have to be careful about thinking about the fairness of, um, of trying to uh, have a little bit denser development in these areas. And we need especially to be concerned about the fact that more than half of the city's black homeowners own homes in those 15 low density neighborhoods. So whatever we do to encourage more density in those um, areas, we've got to be very protective about the, the existing um, black homeownership in those areas because we have obviously a very serious discrepancy between uh, white home ownership rate and black home ownership rate in, in the city. And of course the foreclosure crisis tells us we really have to be careful also in terms of what we do in those low density neighborhoods so that we don't end up with the kind of crash in those neighborhoods and the kind of foreclosure rates in those neighborhoods that we saw after the 2008 uh, crash. And we also have to take into account that those low density areas are disproportionately at risk of flooding. So you see um, the, in the, uh, the blue, you see the 20, 20 100 year flood plain, and um, you see it's in many, many of our low density uh, neighborhoods. So all that needs to be taken into account in thinking about 
um, fairness of, of how much we can ask these neighborhoods to, uh, to accommodate more growth, um, but certainly we need to be having that, that discussion. Um, so what would general density look like? Christian showed some great examples in those um, ADU examples. Let me show a couple of others. To, to, to just give a concept, because many people really have a hard time wrapping their head around what would happen in our single family neighborhoods if we had more gentle density. And really the answer is a few more and smaller homes on the same amount of space, right? On the same uh, lot, which means that you're using small, a lot less lawn, a lot less uh, garden and lawn. The, on the side yards, on the backyards, um, you're going to use that more for housing and less for yards, right? Um, so in Houston, which actually has a, had, had a program for almost 20 years now of allowing densification of townhouses, lots with townhouses on them, and what you saw is some of those uh, areas being, um, being redeveloped at you know, to have two townhouses instead of one townhouse, or um, uh, in the picture here, to really have, um, you know, not attached homes, but, but still detached homes, but at a slightly greater density. You s have the same thing in Portland, where you have a lot of bigger, older houses that were subdivided into two or three, um, and, um, and so you get, you know, two or three times the amount of density in those, uh, in those areas. And of course, through ADUs, which, uh, which Christian mentioned, here's an ADU in a backyard in, in Portland. So how do we move from the picture that I showed you of those single family homes in Queens to uh, a more gentle density um, framework? So let me suggest a couple of things. First is that we take advantage of transit, which is one of the blessings of New York City, right, that we take advantage of transit. And I unfortunately could not overlay these two maps, but if you see that main, uh, you know, corridor of transit availability here, over here, throughout here, you see that there is uh, space that is covered in those low density areas that can, um, uh, accommodate transit-oriented development. So that should really be the first place that we um, think about bringing in higher levels of density. Some of that may be six-story apartment houses rather than the eight to ten um, uh, apartment houses, um, but that's a, uh, you know, an area that's really ripe for uh, slightly more density or a little bit more, uh, even a little bit more density um, to take advantage of the transit and to, um, uh, and to accommodate people's need for housing. One thing that we've learned from watching around the rest of the country is that you need what I'm going to call a whole of regulation approach. When Minneapolis made headlines for ending single family zoning, and, and let me just say, that's a misnomer. We're not like, you know, declaring single family zoning, uh, places illegal tomorrow. They're all grandfathered in, grandparented in, um, but we are saying that no single family going forward cannot just be used for single family. Of course, it could be used for single family unless there's a minimum density imposed, which is not the way that most of these proposals um, run. Um, but what happened is that Minneapolis ended single family zoning but it didn't end all of the things that constrain building two single family zones, which includes the side yards, the backyards, the front yard requirements, the height restrictions, and all kinds of other envelope restrictions that keep buildings from reaching that um, even gentle density that we're talking about. And of course, parking requirements. Um, so, which are, which are uh, a really a thorn in everyone's side. We need to take advantage of traditional models. As you drive around the city, think about how many places you see that are single-family retail, right? We never used to have single-family retail. 
you lived above the store. You had a, a couple of apartments above the store, right? And we've, we seem to have done away with that. In fact, when I was housing commissioner and I would go talk to people and say, you've got three stories above your store. Why isn't it rented out? And they would show me they had taken the stairs out leading up to the, to the, to the upper apartments, right? Um, and they were for boxes, right? For empty boxes instead of for people. So we need to, to revert to um, some of those traditional uh, models. We need to rethink contextual zoning. In the early 2000s, a lot of low density neighborhoods got what were called contextual zones, which, were, which allegedly were to ensure that what got built there fit in, looked compatible, was aesthetically of the same type as what was being built there. But in reality, they were down zones in many cases. They prevented um, the kinds of growth, even that the kinds of, of housing types, even that were there then. Um, and we need to understand that the context today is this crisis in affordability, not a crisis in aesthetics, right? And so we really need to rethink some of those um, contextual uh, rezones. Most importantly, we need to build a coalition. Who might be members of our coalition? Everywhere I went across the city when I was housing commissioner, I would hear from parents. My kids went to college, they want to come home, there's no place for them that's affordable. There's no place in our neighborhood that they can move to. Similarly, people saying, I, you know, I, I want to bring my parent home be uh, here because I need to take care of him or her, right? People who say, look, I'm really struggling to pay the city's increasing property taxes, to pay the energy bill. I need to be able to bring in some rental income. That's a constituency, right? People who care about the climate change implications, that's a constituency. People who care about the habitat, the wetlands, all of the historic treasures that you know, would otherwise be built or be um, used for greenfield development or for redevelopment um, if we don't allow more development in the places where we're already um, uh, living. And those who think it's not fair. It's not fair for some neighborhoods, especially those two in the middle, um, which are places like East New York, Brownsville, Flatbush, those kinds of places that feel like they're being asked to bear more than their fair share of the growth as these higher density neighborhoods are facing the 12 FAR cap and the lower density neighborhoods are enjoying uh, contextual rezones that keep them from, get, from having any new housing. Those concerned about the ep equity implications of what, where the growth would have to go if it doesn't go in New York City and those who want to see our incredible investments in infrastructure, transit, et cetera, um, be efficiently used. So that's just a smattering of who needs to be in that coalition, um, but it, that's really where we're gonna have to focus if we want to see the kinds of changes that we've seen in California and that California has really been a leader on at the state level. So um, let me end there, and, um, and I think we'll have plenty to talk about in terms of how to get there. So. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, both. This was amazing. I think the, the, the overlaps and the, the, um, the notion of coalition, I think, is crucial. I'm sure we'll, we'll get back to that. Um, I would like to open the, um, the questions to, to Wei Ping, um, if you want to to start. Thank you uh, both very much. Uh, really enjoyed and learned a lot uh, in uh, you know, two very mm. different cities, but you come to quite similar ways of thinking about, uh, particularly in terms of density. And I think the, the, the desire to have you know, a large scope of design policy is really in the right place, right? Because we think about the American urban landscape, you know, land is individually owned, housing is market provided, mm -hmm. but 
the collective challenges affordability or the collective memory and space is public good. <coughs> and who's to take care of that, right? So I think, uh, you know, in the school we have uh, uh, students study architecture, students study urban design and urban planning. There's often in between <coughs> space that has not been uh, well cared for in many cities. So I think mm. this, I, I, I find it extremely uh, uh, encouraging in a way in which it moves. And I, I want to, you know, uh, in the interest of time, just raise one kind of question and observation in terms of the central issue of density, right? So if we look at density, you can actually, you know, uh, peel it apart of the many elements that constitute density, right? How many units you build on an acre, and then um, how tall and how, in terms of the lot coverage of each um, building mm -hmm. on the lot, right? So, and then how many rooms can you permit as bedrooms versus other kinds of, you know, required um, conditions that we need for bedrooms? And then how many people can you allow to live in a single bedroom? And I think if you look at all of those elements, the way in which we could uh, uh, achieve uh, gentle density perhaps could be even more. I mean, I grew up in China where, <laughs> you know, we had maybe uh, four to five square meters per person living space as considered to be the most extreme uh, uh, crowding, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, that translates to what... Um, uh, something like uh, 36 to 40 square feet, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so I think there are m other uh, dimensions of design policy that we could potentially look into. For instance, you know, I, I understand, for instance, some uh, basements cannot be used for uh, residential purposes or living purposes because they don't have uh, two uh, egresses. Right, and, 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 and lots of those. Uh, and then now also, we have so many more non-traditional families in which the whole definition of single family housing is sort of out of date. And we have a lot of people who live together uh, with no blood or marriage or what other relationships. So I think you know, all of which can be actually um, you know, peel apart and rethink. And so, I feel like in, in a way that this is really a um, great direction in which we go to uh, the many examples you've shown. On the other hand, we still, for some reason, still stuck in this residential use needs to be residential <coughs> use in terms of the physical areas of city. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and then um, family has to be family, right? So, so, so I, I feel a little bit we're still in that traditional mode of regulation. Uh, and, and so, for instance, um, I know New York a little bit better than Los Angeles. You know, it's kind of jarring to see the juxtaposition of lack of housing, but then uh, the increasing um, commercial vacancy and office vacancy, mm -hmm. right? You, know, you just walk mm -hmm. on Broadway right here, and you see a lot of street level space is completely vacant. On the other hand, we have a lots of um, housing affordability issues. <coughs> and then, of course, we call them real estate because it's difficult to retrofit and to make it, you know, sort of rapid uh, uh, repurposing. But I think in many other uh, places, um, particularly outside the United States, that has been done. So if you look at Japan, for instance, right, the, the, the higher density living uh, arrangements that have been catered to the poor fam uh, single people and family and so on. So um, I don't have an answer. I'm asking you the question and then the whether there is a both, because the challenge with design policy is um, you collectively make policy, but you can only nudge so much the private developers and landowners to conform those policies, like you know the AUD, mm -hmm. right? And it's more of an incentive rather than a requirement. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to pose this question to you as you see that how far can we go 
in terms of pursuing design policies uh, in either the more traditional uh, state of mind or how far can we push it to a more radical change of mind? You want me to start? Sure. Um, oh, uh, it's a great question. Thank you for, for those comments also. I mean, look, I think <coughs> we have to push both our regulatory process, which as a lawyer, you know, I, I, I know how, uh, mm -hmm. how difficult that can be. Um, but we, we also just need to, to push on our vision of what could be accomplished and <coughs> what, how people could live, right? I mean, I think one of the examples that's nearest um, to my heart is, I, I came to New York as a 22 year old um, and the only reason that I was able to come uh, for an internship was that I was able to live in the Webster Apartments for Women, an SRO. My, my room was tiny. I shared a bathroom with all kinds of other women. Um, and, but it was cheap, and it was clean, and it was safe, um, and introduced me to other people, and really made it possible for me to get a toehold in New York, and, and that's why I'm here. We've outlawed that, right? Why, why can't we have that vision again? Why do we have this vision that everybody has to have you know, their own pretty big space, right? Um, I mean, New York, uh, until recently, had a 400 square foot minimum for an apartment, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and, and people would, s would think that you were, I mean, I was once, when I was housing commissioner, I was called a murderer because I wanted to <laughs> propose smaller places so that we could fit more people into those places. Um, so yeah. we don't have a vision of, right. of that as a desirable, you know, and, and what the trade-offs are, right? And, yeah. and until we have that mental vision, we're not gonna get anything done on the regulatory front. Mm. Yeah. I completely agree with that. Thank you for a really important question. I, the, as I mentioned, so much of the conversation about housing policy, particularly in single family neighborhoods in Los Angeles, had been dominated for many decades by these visions of disaster. What would happen if we allowed the second unit, the accessory dwelling unit, the in-law apartment? What would happen if we allowed fourplexes, the um, intense uh, pressure it would put on infrastructure, traffic, parking, et cetera? Um, and it's one of the reasons we arranged the low-rise process in the way that we did by starting in our engagement process by actually asking people about their own neighborhoods and asking them, on the one hand, what they did want to protect, but also what they would like to, how they would like to see their neighborhoods evolve. Mm -hmm. What did they used to have that they no longer have that they would like to bring back? What would they like to add that they see in other cities? Um, and what we heard consistently is that uh, the solutions had to do, to your question, much more, they needed to be focused much more on flexibility and options than on number of units per se. And that meant that, and, and, and COVID and the pandemic really clarified a lot yeah. of these issues for people. We were asking people these questions in the middle of COVID, and so we were hearing a lot of um, aspirational answers that had to do with housing types that would more successfully accommodate multi-generational households, right. of which we have a very high proportion in Los Angeles, and those are precisely the households that suffered the most during COVID, when you had a multi-generational household, typically an overcrowded or rigid housing in terms of zoning, where at least one member of the household had a job that couldn't be done remotely. That person was going out to do that job, and in many cases, bringing COVID back to uh, a household that included elders in, uh, in, in less uh, space than was ideal, and that's really where we saw our worst outcomes. So when we asked that question in a more positive light, what would you like to see added or brought back to neighborhoods? We heard answers that had to do with um, uh, support for corner stores, for reintroducing retail spaces into single family neighborhoods, which mm -hmm. uh, used to be quite common in Los Angeles right. as in most places. Mm -hmm. And the appeal of that really became clear during COVID. People had a lot of time, we all had a lot of time mm -hmm. to sort of analyze our own residential mm -hmm. communities, neighborhoods, and think about what was lacking, what we could walk to, what we couldn't walk to. Uh, of course, in Los Angeles, there are many more places where we noticed what we couldn't walk to than would be the case in New York. 
Um, and also kind of flexibility that um, reflects the changes that people go through during their lifetimes. Most homeowners were renters. They mm -hmm. may, may become renters or want to downsize later in life. They want, might want to be able to age in place. They mm -hmm. might want to, to Vicky's list of the coalition, be able to um, uh, have neighborhoods that support people who grew up in the neighborhood and went away, have mm -hmm. the ability to come back and afford to live there. Um, so then we took that set of aspirations, and why, which is why it was so important to start with the engagement, and then asked the architects and landscape architects who participated to sort of give architectural and landscape form to those uh, sets of questions. Mm. Um, and, and that really was helpful in providing the kind of uh, vision. Uh, and in some ways, that has... You know, we also asked and had requirements in certain categories that um, there, because of those conversations, that the participants in the program, I in the project, include a uh, corner store or mm -hmm. have a shared kitchen, for example, right. um, that, uh. that is now n not legal in Los Angeles as so many other cities to have a communal kitchen that might be shared by four or five or six units. And in some ways, those illustrations, those ideas that we got back from the architects have filtered into policy. So we were remaking all of our community plans, all 35 of them across the city of Los Angeles. And the first few of those to roll out uh, now include um, the mm -hmm. ability to have that kind of small scale retail corner store reintroduced in, um, I in a single family or low rise setting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Adam, please. It's great to have a uh, front row seat, um, really. Very provocative, very interesting, and impossible not to see this as um, a kind of comparison between New York and LA. And I think, um, Vicky, listening to you, I want to separate for a moment the, the sort of the aspiration that you put forward for New York, which in a way is to bring it closer to LA mm -hmm. uh, and, and focus a little bit more on the reality of what development has actually looked like here. And so I think when you, when you start to look at LA and you look at what's really happening in New York, you see in a way a kind of evolution that grows out of the identity of those cities. And in essence, you know, in LA you have this dispersed density, which is getting a bit denser. And in New York City, what you have are pockets of new density that have been appearing that in New York, while we may have this aspiration, what we really see, and I'm quoting Furman Center Materials because that's what everybody reads, is that really the growth in New York is happening in just a handful of community districts. Five to 10 community districts have about 50% of the growth in New York City. So it's not that dispersed model. And so to look at these changes through the lenses of urbanism, of affordability and sustainability to question, are we headed the right direction? You know, in the context of Los Angeles, are we headed the right direction by having this incremental density? What does that mean in terms of transportation? Are we able to shift away from our dependency on cars? Mm -hmm. And in the New York City context, are we able to actually achieve some more of this gentle density? I mean, in essence, you're sort of answering the question of where we may need to go. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we think about affordability, are the ADUs really accomplishing that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when we look at what's happening in New York City, is mandatory affordable housing, 70% of which, or 75% of which is market rate, is that model mm -hmm. really working? And one, one point that, again, is from your materials, is that 90% of the affordable housing that's being built in New York City, that's in unit buildings of 100 units or more, which I think is an astonishing number. And so to take the LA model and to see it happen in New York, will that work? You know, is that, is the, is that a direction for achieving affordability? And then that last lens, so you each get three questions out of this, <laughs> I'm just one, sorry. Um, you know, thinking about all of that new building when in New York and probably in LA, there's that potential for reuse mm. for all of those office buildings. How do we begin to think 
about that? And can we use policy to actually establish some kind of low carbon tax credit that goes with the affordable housing, low income uh, tax credit? Mm. How can we incentivize, uh, incentivize that so we're making use of all that embedded carbon? And again, on the sustainability front, you know, relying on infrastructure rather than cars, taking up open space. So a lot of challenges that we're seeing in order to get to essentially addressing equity and climate crises. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm Chris, happy to go you? first this time. Um, <laughs> thank you, these are really key questions. Um, so I think let's take a step back. I think Vicky very helpfully gave us a list of the coalition that is beginning to emerge around these questions. The list is very similar in Los Angeles in terms of what is giving rise to these new policies and I think gives us some hope of optimism of, of achieving the kind of scale that you're, that you're quite rightly saying is necessary. Um, and I would add to that list the lessons that, that folks, communities have learned from COVID and, and um, during the pandemic is absolutely part of that. Uh, that clarity is, is, is adding to the coalition as well. But let's take a step back to answer your question and think about the coalition that has been in place to protect the status quo. I think it's very important to understand um, the <laughs> strength and diversity of that coalition and why it's been able, at least in the LA context, which I understand, uh, why it's been able to maintain that status quo despite all the evidence um, that we need to shift. Um, and it's a surprisingly wide-ranging coalition in Los Angeles. So it, it includes, of course, uh, classic NIMBY, NIMBYism. It includes white, wealthy homeowners in the hills. Um, but it also includes a number of communities of color who have really good reason to be skeptical of what land use reform coming down from city, county, state, or federal government will look like, given the histories of those attempts in the 20th century and how things like uh, freeway expansion and other kinds of things were sold to those communities in the 20th century. Um, it includes the council offices that I mentioned and those planning deputies I mentioned. Um, it includes land use attorneys and other experts in, in land use, um, all of whom benefit from a status quo that maintained a kind of scarcity, a number of, of uh, housing developers, of course, all of whom benefit uh, from the kind of scarcity that makes any new housing production that can get through this Byzantine system more valuable than it would be in a place like Houston, for example, where that, those constraints don't, uh, don't exist. <laughs> That's why we approached um, our process in the way that we did. It's, it's easy enough, as you sometimes hear from housing advocates, to say, well, why not just make 20-unit projects <coughs> you know, legal in single-family neighborhoods across the city? The climate crisis demands it. The housing affordability and homelessness crisis demand it. Um, there is a political dimension that has to be uh, untangled, right, that includes all of those actors, uh, very powerful actors in various ways, um, some powerful because of their wealth, some powerful because of their political influence that have maintained this status quo of limited housing production across Los Angeles. So that means building a case for not just doing the things we're talking about, but accelerating them as quickly as possible to meet the need that you're quite rightly identifying. So that means going from two units on a single family lot, which has been successful, but is not enough and does not promote mm -hmm. affordability in the way that it needs to, to uh, where state law now takes us, which I mentioned SB9, which allows fourplexes. There was a companion bill, SB10, that allows 10 units on a single family lot, um, but cities have to opt in rather than uh, figure out how to apply um, uh, new state housing law. So we have to get, now if we had 10 units on a single family lot available across uh, uh, that map that I showed, that might get us some way, and, th and there were fewer constraints to actually building, we addressed the housing, uh, the parking requirements. Um, it's about building the political case in the coalition to get us from two to 10, right? Uh, which is very complicated, but we do have to accelerate that as much as possible. Um, and that's what these efforts have really tried to do, building. And so and the way that the ADU success story has happened, Vicky's right that that's a real success story for the state, but it is, there's been a lot of trial and error. Um, the state uh, passed ADU streamlining in 2018. Um, then cities could either try to support that new state law as Los Angeles did or try to block it like a lot of cities in Orange County, Huntington Beach uh, did. 
and then over time the the the, um, the laws are taken back up in Sacramento and streamlined, and all of the issues that Vicky identified are ironed out. And those have largely been ironed out. The parking requirements, other mm -hmm. things, have been ironed out for ADUs. They need to be ironed out for the fourplexes and then for the larger units. And then the last thing I'll say on the question of reuse. This is incredibly important. I mentioned that the uh, two to 10 units are the cheapest to build on a per unit basis. There is one category that's significantly cheaper, and that is taking an existing single family house and subdividing it into four units, mm -hmm. uh, which is not quite legal yet in Los Angeles. You can do up to three units through a kind of junior ADU program. Um, and soon, perhaps, you'll be able to just subdivide your single family house into four units. That is by far, um, some studies suggest, less than $100,000 per unit to do that work yeah. versus about 175 to 200,000 a unit for you know, two to four, let's say, wood frame construction. Um, and then we, another real success story from LA's housing policy over the last 20 to 25 years is our adaptive reuse ordinance, which was passed in the late 1990s, which allowed uh, commercial buildings downtown only, it was limited to downtown Los Angeles, to be converted into residential projects with a minimum of red tape, no parking requirements, et cetera. Because of the success of that program, most of the low-hanging fruit, which is smaller floor plate pre-war buildings, which are easier and cheaper to convert from commercial to residential, have I largely agree. been converted, at least downtown. Mm -hmm. So there is now an effort that I was working on and met with many colleagues in Adaptive Reuse 2.0, which would both expand it beyond downtown and also think about those larger floor plate buildings, which of course, as any architect can tell you, are much more complicated to think about uh, in terms of conversion to residential. So um, there is a lot of opportunity there, and I completely agree that's an area where we should be focusing for climate and all kinds of other reasons. I totally agree with Christopher on all of those points. Um, so let me, let me um, jump in on the affordability question. I mean, first of all, having more supply in general will be helpful, right? bring down that um, that gap that I showed, bring up those vacancy rates that I showed. So even having more supply, forget about income restricted, is important. Nevertheless, I really want to say that I think one of the mistakes that's going on in, in New York right now is the, the mayor's proposal for office conversions um, required no affordability. And we We've been there, we've done that. Look at downtown, uh, the Fidei district where we allowed conversions very successfully. We got a lot of housing out of those old office buildings, mm -hmm. underused office buildings in, in the financial district. Not a shred of affordable housing there, right? Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't make that same mistake again. Um, w you know, we need to work out the economics of it, yes, but we've managed to do that for all kinds of new construction, we ought to be able to figure it, be able to figure it out for those office conversions. Um, and this, a second point about those office conversions is, we do need to think about what kind of neighborhoods are we creating, mm -hmm. and if it's just like you know one office building, I mean I'm sorry, one conversion to residential surrounded by you know five blocks of old oh, well, commercial, that's okay. mm -hmm. uh, gonna not feel very good. Right, um, and we're going to have all kinds of debates about schools and all of those kinds of things. So we need to think more generally about the urban design that needs to go along with um, with those conversion uh, policies, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, I, I mean, remember that slide that I showed that that suggested that we needed almost seven hundred thousand new homes to house the twenty eight percent of our renters who make below. 28,000 for a family of four, right? So we've got to have affordable housing. It's, there's got to be built into every one of the programs some kind of affordable housing. That's hard when we're talking about an ADU, right? But when we're talking about a fourplex or, or a sixplex, one can make it work, right? Um, requires thoughtfulness, but one, one can make it work. Um, and I, I think that's just, but we just have to do that. We have to commit to do that. It seems to be essentially a question of imagination as well, mm. or the imaginary, let's say, uh, as I get it, to move beyond the sort of low-hanging fruits that mm -hmm. Christopher mentioned before. Imagination, vision, and I would say 
empathy, right? Empathy. Both okay. LA and New York are, are cities built upon being the gateway to the rest of the United States. And mm -hmm. if we lose that vision of ourselves as mm -hmm. you know, the place where people from all over the world, from all over the United States come, we, we will have lost a very significant part of our vision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's definitely so much yes. opportunity for the architects, planners, real estate students out there to meet these challenges. But I think just understanding the need for more units overall, but looking at those vacancy rates, if you were to look at the percentage of vacancy rates for rents below $2,500, it's like 0.5%. Yeah. And then if you look at the vacancy rates above uh, $2,500 a month, it might be 10%. Yeah. And so, you know, the mathematics of our mandatory inclusionary housing policy, which is 70% market rate and 30% affordable, is really hard. Like it's moving that needle to address the renters that you're describing. And I know because this was your job for many years to, to try and figure this out. But some of those, some of the, some of that math isn't quite matching up. And to understand, you know, for you perhaps the the model that you're looking to is less relying on things like MIH and more relying on smaller initiatives by homeowners to help get there. And maybe it's a different kind of policy. I think on the macro level, we really need to be looking to the federal government too. If you think about, yeah. there's a, th one of the tropes that um, uh, I could have added to that list about Los Angeles is that we're a city of homeowners. In fact, we have one of the highest percentages of rental households in the country. It's, um, it's roughly two thirds, which puts us in the top four or five mm -hmm. on a percentage basis in the country. And if you think about all of the subsidy, particularly at the federal level, that mm -hmm. is supporting the single family home, um, and the ways in which that could be tweaked, and that has to happen at the federal level, it seems to me, to subsidize rental households to uh, a, a similar degree when you think about the mortgage reduction and all the other. And in the Los Angeles context, even that, that image I showed of the case study house, um, you know, the Shulman, those great Shulman photographs suggest those houses kind of swimming in isolation, but in fact it was uh, freeway construction paid yeah. for, you know, maybe 90% on the dollar, uh, 90 cents on the dollar by the federal government that supported that kind of uh, low density development across the region, to, you know, to say nothing of, of, of those um, of those mortgage deduction um, policies. So there are there are a whole range of ways in which the renter could be better supported by the federal government um, than um, as compared to the homeowner. For sure. And I would just add that one of the challenges of, of densifying uh, relatively low density areas is you know, you've got a transition problem and you need some way of thinking about how do I aggregate a few single family lots together so that I can build a, a six story apartment building or that kind of thing. So we really need to be thinking about, well, what's the government's role there? What What's the role of like, could the government buy it, put it into a community land trust? That mm -hmm. would ensure some level of affordability. So there are opportunities here mm -hmm. as well that we need to be thinking about. I just also wanted to pick up on something Vicky said a couple of minutes ago, which is so important, and that is the larger narrative of the pace of change. So in Los Angeles, which of course had long dedicated itself to the idea that it was continually in flux, that it was defined by flux and change evolution, um, the narrative by the time I got to the Los Angeles Times had sort of been hijacked by folks who had decided that the pace of change had accelerated too much. And that included a lot of colleagues of mine at the LA Times, that included policymakers, elected officials, who were all working to slow down that race of rate of change, which had significant uh, and long-lasting impacts on the rate of housing production, among other things. So that's why these larger narratives are important and, and rest in control to say Los Angeles is now losing population. Um, it is changing at a slower pace than it has throughout its modern history. In fact, mm -hmm. what we need to accelerate to get back to what lo makes Los Angeles Los Angeles is, is actually more of that flux, not less of it, despite what you hear um, in, in, in the sort of dominant narrative, let's say, over the last generation, I would say. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is a, a good moment to open it up to the audience here for any questions. See in the back there. The microphone is coming down. Yeah. 
Um, uh, thank you so much. I just have a question about the um, attributes that were being used to describe um, the renters and homeowners. Um, uh, there was a lot about like race and ethnicity or income, mm -hmm. but I didn't see much about like the profession. Um, and I was thinking about, for example, college towns, or um, mm -hmm. you mentioned DC and how there are a lot of government workers there. And I, I wonder if you could maybe talk about that. Uh, I mean, um, of course, profession is wrapped up in, in some of those other categories as well. There's a lot of overlap. Um, certainly college towns, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know the LA scene um, uh, around its college campuses. Obviously, we're sitting in the middle of one um, and, and have many throughout um, the city that are critically important and could be being pushed more in terms of employee-assisted housing for those kinds of professions, mm -hmm. right? Um, um, for, you know, uh, professors like me, for example, uh, you know, there there could be a lot more that was being done to provide for employee-assisted housing by the university for the the whole yeah. range of the faculty and staff, which would be important. We we haven't had that in New York City to hardly any degree, and I think it could be a, a really important um, thing. A second point is that. I think our business community needs to step up and and be an advocate on this, right? They are bringing jobs, and we want them to bring jobs, um, but they also need to understand that the housing needs to be there. And in, in New York City, what we've seen is that businesses no longer, or the major businesses in, in New York City, no longer think of themselves as a New York-based corporation. They're international in scope. They could go anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're not stepping into this civic discourse about what we need to do to grow, how we need to grow, that kind of thing. And, and I th think that's a real gap um, that, that does play into the question of, are you a you know, university town, or are you a tech town, or are you a government worker town mm -hmm. um, in a very important way? Just a quick um, thought on the perspective in Los Angeles on this question. Um, one of the elements that really exacerbated our housing affordability uh, crisis in Los Angeles was that for many decades, uh, promoting job growth and economic development uh, was politically safe and palatable in a way that promoting uh, housing development and housing growth was not. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was particularly true in areas on the west side of Los Angeles, uh, where between 2010 and 2020, roughly speaking, cities like Santa Monica, Culver City, elements, uh, um, uh, neighborhoods of the city of Los Angeles on the west side uh, were attracting something like eight, or nine new jobs for every new housing unit that was being produced. Um, so you saw a number of um, high-end employment centers in places like Santa Monica um, being added without the political <laughs> will to uh, provide housing, which meant that the burden of housing affordability fell on other parts of the region. Um, it also meant that the city of Santa Monica, for example, uh, essentially stayed the same population-wise between 1970 and 2020 while adding untold thousands of uh, numbers of jobs, the so same dynamic in, uh, in Culver City and other cities on the west side. Um, so it was that gap between the safety, politically speaking, of promoting job growth versus the difficulty of promoting uh, new housing really exacerbated it. And then that has led to a dynamic now with the population in LA, city and county plateauing. The people who are leaving are leaving largely for housing affordability reasons, and the people who are moving in are coming because they are economically mobile and they're coming in to take a, one of the high, higher paying jobs in a place like Santa Monica, right? So that just further exacerbates the issue, and the, and the households that are leaving are largely communities of color. We've seen the black population 
in the city of Los Angeles declined by more than 25, almost 30% um, since 1980. So really, really significant declines and having, as I said, almost everything to do with housing affordability. So just maybe to add another dimension to your question is also the proportion of renters versus owners can also depend on mm. quote unquote the, the, whether the location is a hot market, right? So if you look at New York, you are going to have much higher proportion of renters. You know, people like us, right, would have owned, right, uh, if we were uh, teaching, I don't know, in Maryland, right? Um, because uh, it's very expensive to own in New York, and so you will have, mm, or Boston, these are typical hot markets where uh, the proportion of renters can be much higher. Uh, so it really varies by geography. You've got renters, and then you've got short-term renters. <laughs> now there's a big piece about how there are more Airbnb listings in New York City now than there are apartment listings. So we've got different kinds of renters, which really throws off the market in all sorts of ways. Yeah, But they're cracking down on Airbnb, right? They're, they're yeah, I think. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> trying. We, we, we also have a lot of uh, questions from the, the planetary cohort, which there's no time to go through all of them. And a lot actually had to do with um, this sort of challenging notions of, of the, the, the nuclear family, other ways of living together, all the way to sort of relationships between different species that might come up. But, but we sort of touched uh, upon that already. Maybe one thing I, I do want to bring up, since we're in a school um, of, of architecture and the built environment, in, in the end, that there's a question from, from Miri Powell um, who wonders um, how curricula or education more broadly um, could could potentially, or if it's needed, to, to change for architecture students in response to the changing roles and responsibilities of architects that, that you know, th th they believe your work um, uh, sort of demonstrates. And similarly, uh, Catherine and our work um, asks um, if um, you see a specific role for design professionals, and I'm looking, of course, at you, Christopher, as well, but, 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 but the sort of, um, in, in what was, like, position or, or place in the process like architects and urban planners and other professionals of the built environment could be placed within this sort of policy framework, let's say. I'm sort of rephrasing her question here. but mm. Uh, yeah. mm. Just quickly on the curriculum question, um, it is a matter of broadening the ways in which we understand some of those iconic images from architectural history. So when I was learning about the case study program, I certainly was not learning about uh, highway subsidy or redlining right. or any of the things that I think students learn about now. So I think a lot has changed in a very positive way in terms of the thinking more about, as Andres was saying, these kinds of intersections, all the areas that architecture touches on. And a lot of this, frankly, is coming from the students and really insisting to your question about reuse, really thinking, insisting that you know we hear mo most of this from students and young architects um, primarily that before we think about any new construction, we had to be thinking about adaptive reuse of all the existing resources and think about the embodied carbon that might be. Um, and those questions might be addressed by, let's say, making it easier to subdivide a, 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 an existing house into four, um, into four units. And then in the, in the larger question about design professionals, um, it's, it's, it's really about a kind of uh, communication and translation among the different uh, groups that, you know, a lot, big part of my job in the mayor's office was um, sort of moving between, you know, my colleagues in the planning department who are really working on the nitty gritty of these new community plans or working on procurement language uh, for new housing um, and uh, f to communities and really explaining to each of those what we were hearing on the other side of the equation and um, really developing those skills primarily among, you know, not least among architects. One of the things I've been teaching at Yale is trying to get uh, um, the, the future architects at the School of Architecture to think about the role that the written word, writing, and these sort of larger narratives play, both in terms of them as subjects, architects who will be written about, but also as authors, architects who can use the written word, use that uh, sort of uh, set of narrative strategies as a kind of secret weapon to situate themselves within the field, give themselves a different kind of agency within the field. Um, so that's part of it as well. You know, I actually want to add um, uh, even more to that. Um, we used to have a faculty, Anna Pujna, 
she did a research project called Cities Without Kitchens, I believe. Yeah. I, and and <laughs> so it, it's actually so radical, but if you think about the social ramifications of housing without kitchens, then you think about it, who cooks anymore, right? We <laughs> do a lot of takeout. Why do we always have to design with, you know, housing all have their own kitchens, kitchens right? Yeah. But I think what is more profound for her, for her research and then her teaching is that it actually who, you know, in the traditional uh, sort of domesticity of a family life, who was doing all the cooking? It was mm -hmm. all the women. And, 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 and so in a way, it was very radical as a social uh, idea. And I, so I think for architects and planners, I think we all have the potential to think beyond the built environment because the built environment both is the uh, platform that contains our social behavior, but it can also uh, reshape social behavior and even social norms. So I would say add to add to your point, Christopher, in terms of the cross-disciplinary within the built environment um, uh, um, fields is to think even more broadly uh, how we live and pass through space could actually reshape how we interact and so on. So I just thought that project was just mm -hmm. really radical and, 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 and great way of thinking about it, different kinds of uh, um, domesticity <coughs> and woman's mm -hmm. role mm -hmm. and, and also how we actually live now. Mm. Any thoughts? Uh, well, as not an architect or an <laughs> urban planner, but as a lawyer, um, I, I think w across the professions we need to teach people to get to yes. We, you know, we spend a lot of time teaching people to be a roadblock mm -hmm. and that's not that's not where we should be yeah certainly not in my profession <laughs> <Got it. laughs> so. um, first thank you very much for amazing great presentations and thank you for working for our cities not everyone does that and that's very important um, on design policy thank you Vicky for the slide that shows the income 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 gap I think the, the issue of rents outpacing income is a central one. And when we think about affordability crisis, we usually concentrate on all the people that cannot afford homes. And sometimes we don't see the flip side of the inequality that has been created in these 40 years with so many people having two homes, mm -hmm. so many people benefiting from uh, mortgage uh, deductions that are, you know, that are very, very high deductions. When you think about policy, uh, so there's two questions. One, have you calculated the, the kind of subsidy that that second or third slide would necessitate? You know, if, if there are mm -hmm. almost 800,000 people that need, that make 28,000, but we need to make 76,000 to afford the house, the, the housing that we are able to do, what, in, what would be that in terms of money? Mm -hmm. uh, and two, um, w if, if, you, if you have thought about that, where should that subsidy come from? Uh, Christopher mentioned more active role of the federal government. Would that be, uh, have you thought about whether that is in uh, restructuring taxes or, um, um, you know, or any other ways of uh, kind of closing that gap. For me to, um, so great question, thank you. Um, I mean, there have been calculations of what it would take um, and by and large, they are less than the kind of money that we have devoted to home ownership as, as Christopher was saying. So it can be done. We've done it before to, to help people become homeowners. We could do it now to help narrow that gap. But also, I, I think that we need to understand that that graph that I showed shows that housing affordability is a two-pronged thing. Houses are too costly and jobs aren't paying enough, right? And um, we need more federal government role in making wages better, in making wages more stable, right? Um, there's a role for local governments on that in terms of minimum wage, in terms of 
uh, again, sort of uh, income stability um, measures. And we need to also think about, do we need to give people a home, which is the way that we normally, when we talk about affordable housing, we're giving a person a home, right, uh, an apartment. We could give them more money, um, and that might be more effective in, in, in any number of ways. And so we really need to think about all of those different dimensions and also call it for what it is. I mean, when, when we subsidize housing to be built at an income-restricted level for affordability, people say, oh, you're subsidizing poor people or poorer people, right? We're subsidizing their employers. Right? right. Well, yes, yeah. we're subsidi for working people. We're subsidizing their employers. Um, so you know, let's let's be frank about that, and think about what that means in, in terms of our public policy. I think that's that's exactly right. And I have two quick thoughts. First, to your point about kitchens and flexibility, we're moving a little bit in that direction in Los Angeles <laughs> in our new zoning code, which has been comprehensively um, rethought for the first time since the 1940s, believe it or not, um, does uh, rely to a certain degree on form-based code, which would could be uh, agnostic about program mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. could lead to the kind of flexibility that you're talking about where you could imagine spaces, um, volumes of space that um, could accommodate any number of uses, uses that could change uh, over time, and that includes not just interior, but also exteriors, exterior mm -hmm. space where you think about where parking requirements are now in place but might be relaxed, having spaces that could be um, uh, easily converted to other kinds of outdoor use, right? Um, on this, um, this other question, I, I think we, yeah, we, I think the flip side or the potential danger of this kind of an intersectional approach that Andres was talking about is that we ask architecture uh, and urban design to bear the burdens of a number of, of larger issues, economic and societal right, issues, yeah, right, yeah, that, yeah. that are not architectures to bear and that architecture um, uh, has no hope of, of, of solving in a larger sense. So I think that's important to, to, mm -hmm. to clarify and we tried to make clear in all the initiatives that we were working on that we were asking architects to help us illustrate and clarify these issues in some of the ways out of them rather than um, saying that it should fall on the shoulders of architects to solve this larger uh, yeah. question of inequality, right, which has grown in all the ways that uh, a number of you have pointed out. I wanted to pick up on the discussion about getting to yes and what it means to have a coalition because I think there are some indicators out there and struggles of how to do that. Um, one, I think, just recognizing the benefits of density and getting people to understand that with more density can come more infrastructure, can come a different kind of communal way of living just by, by being able to provide more amenities. But thinking about uh, what getting to yes looks like through processes, some of that involves a series of stakeholders from real estate developers through to community residents. Thinking about zoning is not just about form, which I think you're beginning to address, but as a kind of performance. And there have been uh, ways in which uh, neighborhood initiatives have, have looked at performance-based zoning, which looks at a range of things beyond just uses and form, but also uh, ownership, um, uh, ways in which labor uh, participates in the process, um, thinking about how the public space takes shape. Um, so really thinking about what it means to have a process uh, is really critical and it's starting to happen in fits and starts in places where the people are rethinking that and it can't just be top down. Mm -hmm. Just a quick thought on that and then I, I hand it to Vicky um, on this question of coalition building. Um, there, is, there has been a kind of narrative that community engagement necessarily dilutes the ambition of, of public uh, design projects, and, and I think that is not only false, we really tried to work to counter that notion. It all comes down to how the engagement process is designed itself, and it has to be designed in a very thoughtful, strategic, intentional way, and the best example of how um, to move 
away from models that haven't worked is the kind of classic model in a community meeting of putting a microphone stand at the, having a meeting on a weekday evening, putting a microphone stand down um, uh, near the stage and having people who, who want to um, uh, express their opinions given an opportunity to versus a much more targeted approach that meets people where they are, that thinks about multilingual mm -hmm. um, conversations, that thinks about childcare, that thinks about um, uh, a actually paying people for their time, which we tried to do whenever possible. We tried to raise, as we were raising money for the budgets for these projects, think about compensating people uh, for their time and having uh, facilitated conversations, again, that really are about how we would like to see our neighborhoods evolve, what we would like to add, rather than uh, the same few people venting about, um, again, the pace of change in their neighborhood, which they see as too, as too fast. No. I think that's a great place to end. We're out of time, as always, with affirmations. Uh, they tend to go on much longer, but that's great. It was a great conversation. I want to say to everybody that next week uh, we'll have uh, Paula Tavares and Sylvia rivera Cusicanqui uh, with Emmanuel Atmasu discuss the topic of indigenous worldings for affirmations for. Um, for now, thank you very much, and thanks for thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.